On this episode of Content Sessions, we talked to Marlon Rodriguez about Flex Day. Thanks for coming. You bet. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm, uh, I was actually glad I got a hold of you. I, uh, I think like everybody else in the world recently saw your LinkedIn post that you were officially leaving the offices forever. Apparently that post... Crazy. 400,000 people <laughs> interact with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And uh, I had originally reached out to Justin, yep. who I talked Our to. Founder. He, the founder, yeah. And he said that you were the guy to talk to about everything. So here <laughs> we are. <laughs> These things. Perfect. So uh, to take me back, tell, tell me a little bit about Flex Day. What do you guys do? Yeah. So uh, we're a two year old startup in Toronto. Uh, our focus is to give individuals a better place to work than coffee shops are working from home. And, uh, and, and so we make it really easy to do that. We, um, through a mobile app, give you access to 37 locations in Toronto that you can access for as little as $3 a day without any monthly commitments or overages or anything else. We think that you should be fundamentally untethered. Most of the tools are already in your bag. Yeah. And so we want to help you to find the spaces to be productive, do the work you need to do, have the meetings and have spaces to think. Love that. Yeah, it's such a great concept. Um, so, so was it Justin originally, it was his sole idea, his baby? Yeah, he was building it in a sandbox. Like Justin is probably best known for uh, building Halo Toronto and then Halo North America. Halo is the ride hailing company yeah. before Uber and yeah, Lyft they were in town. They were on Queen Street. Just nearby. They were nearby, yeah, yes, I remember nearby. them. Yeah. And I'd had hundreds of rides in that. So like, you know, Justin's been building technology for 20 years. Um, that was probably the place, that, that's probably the brand that people know best about him. Uh, but through that entire journey, he's become really aware of transportation and the challenges of moving people around in cities. Sure. And so, like, one of the questions is, like, you know, how do you solve rush hour, right? Now, that's, like, a problem that every major city tries to solve. Mm -hmm. um, and really, the answer isn't any of the typical things that come up, which is, like, you know, put more people, on, put more buses on the road, put more trains, build a new line. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's, it's, like, give people not to get on the train at rush hour. Sure. <laughs> That's yeah. really the only way to solve rush hour. Makes um, sense, and yeah. there are some parts of the city, like we're sitting in the mayor's office uh, a couple months ago, and they were explaining to us that there's a segment on Young Street, which is Young is the, boat, the longest street in the world, mm -hmm. right? That's, there's a segment from Bloor to Eglinton where the population has grown 60% over the last 10 years. And there's just no way that infrastructure can keep up with, just keep up with what it needs to be today, never mind the trajectory of a city like Toronto. Yep. And so what comes out of that was like, well, what are all the different ways we can reroute some of that traffic into their own neighborhoods or create more permission for people to work closer to home? Um, and so, you know, iterating, iterating, iterating on a sandbox, which is the <laughs> right thing to do as a startup, um, he cornered this problem, right? Matchmaking between people who could fundamentally be working closer to home yep. um, and spaces that are already probably enabled for that type of interaction and then building the experience between. Very cool. And so um, it, I've, I've been on the app. I, was, I had actually used it before we, we had interacted. So I found it interesting because there's obviously some restaurants and places local to me. And I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting. So what when I walk into that bar that I'm not, a I'm not attached to a Flex Day account, mm -hmm. um, what's the experience versus just going to sit in a place? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, I think probably the biggest thing we do on both sides of that equation is we create a new social contract, right? So if you were to walk into the average restaurant and they got Wi-Fi, they're in the hospitality business, they'd say, Mike, come on in. Yep, have a seat here. What can I get you? Mm -hmm. Right, and they're bringing the menu out. Um, and you are now in a service interaction, their traditional interaction. Right. And so they're kind of expecting to you know, wait on you. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some sort of implied um, interaction there that you're going to keep buying as long as you're sitting in that seat. Yep. I feel, I felt, <laughs> I felt a lot of that in my life. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and like that's what those businesses do. But um, what we're doing is finding spaces in their calendar that just aren't as busy. And that's just the nature of the calendar. You're not going to be 100% busy all the time. Yep. Um, and ex help them to extend their hospitality a few degrees over to invite people in for more of a lingering use case, right? They're going to come, they're going to sit down under this premise, the flex day premise, yep. and they're probably not going to read regu lead, need regular service. Right. They're probably going to want coffee or water, and maybe they're going to want a menu, right. uh, but it sets your expectation right up front on the service end so like that, that they're not tied up 
in servicing someone that's not intending to engage like that. Yeah. And then on the member end, you're not feeling this anxiety of like renting your seat for the cost of Americanos every right. hour and you're over caffeinated because yeah, you yeah. want to be that guy. Right. right. So that, that's what we're doing. And we're creating ease in that relationship on both sides. Right. You're, you're four salads in thinking, fuck. Yeah. I, don't be, <laughs> I don't need this, but I also don't want to be that guy or I'd love yeah. to come back here. And so I don't want to be, you know, blacklisted or yeah. something. <laughs> and, uh, and so how, um, how are, how are the businesses that you're going into? I would imagine people like myself, who's a nomadic, my entire team's nomadic. I yeah. love the option yep. because I can say, hey, you don't have to come to the West End or you want to get out of your apartment, boom, it's like four or five bucks and it's a great little. So I, I'm guessing those that user base likes it. How have the venues been? How's that, has that been going? Mixed results or overall pretty good? Yeah, uniformly good results. Yeah. Um, this is a new thing, right? Yeah. And so I think... That's, that's one thing that our initial partners, which we're like so thankful for, have, have taken the step with us on this journey. Um, they've, um, they've been really transparent with us. And so the initial premise of it was to say like, look, this is, think about us as like new lead generation. We're not quite sure what they're gonna do, but they're here, you yeah. know, these new potential customers. Um, and now they get, you get to meet them. Yeah. In a city like Toronto, there are 6,000 restaurants. Yeah. And so one of the challenges of a restaurant is like how to stay relevant and how to stay heard, how to meet new customers efficiently, economically. Yep. Um, and so this was saying, look, you already have all the assets. You're already here. Yep. Let's find a way to bring those people in. But what we're really surprised by, and I think we're really positively enabled by, is, is we're actually seeing our, our members spending money in those spaces. Yeah. And in some cases, spending more money per table than their regular customers. Right. And so that's been, you know, we, we kind of knew that because, like, that's us too. Yeah. You know, I, I was just at one of our member locations. You sit there and you're like, wow, that's the special today. That's amazing. I'm having that. Right. Um, and that's what's happening to, to, uh, to the, the whole membership is they're sitting in these spaces. They're a little surprised by the menus or... Uh, often um, attracted to what they're what's in front of them. They may not be buying every time, but it's sort of like a give first relationship. They feel some sort of positive yeah. valence here, and when they're buying, they're buying right off the menu, and and that's good for everyone. For sure, you know, and that's also like if you think about, you know, in your case, it, you know, the journey from here to having your own office, the average. Um, office owner spends something like fifteen hundred dollars a month on the carrying cost of an employee. Right. Right. That is absurd. That's not even paying the person. Right. That's like the space that the person sits in. Yeah. And so now for like not very much money, maybe a few hundred dollars, you're yeah. able to like have the space, have like a humane environment and, you know, equip your people with all the hydration and nourishment they need. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and the reason I asked that is I, I've had some clients in the restaurant, those hospitality spaces mm. before. And like, I know, you know, I, I work, I work with a, a pizza chain, fairly large pizza chain and yep. You know, they get approached all the time by Uber Eats, yeah. by this technology, by that technology. Yeah. And restaurants and bars are the most inundated with, hey, come buy this thing. Hey, yeah. you need this now. Hey, payment processing. Hey, online ordering. Hey, right. whatever different things. So it's funny usually to talk to them. They're already, they're, people get so exhausted by how much they get approached for stuff like that. Totally. But yeah, it's, it's cool that the response has been. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's nobody else is walking to them. And I mean, this is, this is our experience so far. Mm -hmm and saying, let's generate new business at no, no money, no commitment. Mm. Um, and these are brand new customers, which when you calculate the lifetime value, you're talking about like thousands of dollars, right? Um, you know, I think some of the delivery apps are trying to make that claim, but the, mm. the bite right up front is pretty significant. And the user experience is unlikely to result in the restaurant. Right. And we're literally saying we're, we're putting people in, in seats restaurant. in your restaurant. This isn't about subverting anything. This yeah. is about amplifying you. Um, yeah. And then it's over to you, right? Your hospi hospitality, your menu, um, the way you treat the, the members is all going to help you. So. Sure. And then do they, so each restaurant or each venue, because now you've got some retail, you've got some yeah. other spaces, are they saying kind of, here's the hours, here's the max people we can take, and yep. here's, yeah, basically. That's it. Yeah. So you think about it as kind of like the Airbnb model, right? Like for people that are on Airbnb, you could do the whole month if that's what you wanted, or it happens that you're away for a weekend, and so you post for a weekend. We're getting to that degree of flexibility. Right now what we're saying is, look, you, you kind of know what days of week and what hours of the week you're not busy. Yeah. When there's a section that you're not scheduling just because it's unlikely to, to, to be filled. Right. Uh, and so put that on the network. Start there, yeah. right? That is going to waste. That is leftovers. Yeah. 
Um, and so that's the starting point um, with the retailers. It's often, so we got one, um, we got one retailer on Ossington, um, which is kind of the cool street in Toronto. <laughs> um, but they're called Ollie Quinn. They're an eyewear company, London-based. And they have this curious space in the back. You know, most retail stores don't have a space you can go and open your laptop and like work and have meetings. Right. But they built that for themselves and they've left it open to us. And yeah. it's amazing. You get regular foot traffic there. Um, and so for them, it's, it's like they're meeting people that they might not have met right. in like kind of this beautiful, um, valuable interaction to start. And then maybe you might want to hang out and like participate in more of the programs, or maybe you actually want a pair of glasses. I don't yeah. wear glasses and I was there yesterday. Sure. Right? <laughs> so that's sort of interesting. Um, we started working with, um, coffee shops, which is kind of an interesting use case. Like, Hey, aren't you trying to pull people out of coffee shops? Well, there's some coffee shops that are actually amazing for work. They yeah. actually built for this use case. Yeah. Like, and so uh, there's one on uh, oh, what the hell is it on Avenue Road? Yeah, that's quite good. It's Creeds. Creeds. Yeah, they're on our network. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I have one of my uh, one of my subcontractors works there all the time, and I yeah. happened to pop in to see her the other day, and yeah, yeah. it's really cool. Right. Really it's good the spot. atmosphere. It's open every day. It's open early, mm. um, and so for them, it's it's about like high utilization. Right. They'd love to have all of the seats full. Um, and so for that, for us and our, our relationship with them, it's about getting them to full utility. Yeah. All right. And then the, 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 the group that we are just starting to work with, um, uh, and I think it'll be significant for us is, is the co-working spaces, right? There are 160 co-working offices in Toronto and they're Shit. spread out all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and if you talk to our members, they're saying, you know, this is great. I get to bounce around the city, but every once in a while, like a kind of want a more structured environment. Right. I want to have more meetings. I love having the craft beer on tap. Mm. Um, and that's a different price point. But what's happening on the co-working side is it's opaque to the members about what that, you know, application process might be, registration, what the hours are, all of, like, how much does it cost, all that stuff. And so you stop. Mm. And that sucks, right? And so what we're doing is we're helping them to highlight their day passes and say, look, our entire model is on-demand workspace yep. and so you've got this day pass that's meant to be an on-demand workspace option um, why not create that inroad and so we've got the first handful of partners I think eight locations now yep. um, and talking to many more um, and that's that's again like you think of think about this story it's this whole spectrum of options from three dollars per day up to twenty five dollars per day yeah only as you need it where you need it and and you get to match you know where you are in the city and what vibe you're looking for or what type of environment you need. Yeah. Um, so we, we want to give you that freedom. And so that's, that's very much a focus of ours. Yeah. I like that a lot. And I think it's funny. I'm, you're seeing it everywhere now. I was in, oh, I was in Mississauga a couple of weeks ago. I had to pop in to grab something at Aaron Mills town center. And like, sure. they have a co-working space yeah, yeah. in the mall now because yeah. these retail stores are kind of, <laughs> yeah. not sure what, some of them are just <laughs> gone, right? but I mean, like why, if you've got space, it's dead. Like, Totally. What are you doing with it? And it's absurd, right? You, so you think about a place like Toronto, and like for us, we feel this very strongly. Um, 2% vacancy rate in, in commercial offices in the core. There's something like 8% year over year price increase per square foot. Um, and so on the outside, you might think, holy crap, like we've run out of space, right? And we're yeah. feeling it commercially, we're feeling it residentially. But as it turns out, when we think about the commercial use cases, this is work. During the day, there are tons of spaces right around those expensive, fully locked up spaces right. that are completely empty. Yeah. And beautiful and viable and equipped and, and just happy to meet you. Right. right. And so in, the, in that sort of world, you know, you start to like rethink your city. Yeah. A city like Mississauga, where I grew up, has like it's super spread out. Mm -hmm. And so like Aaron Mills Town Center, where we used to go play mini golf, <laughs> is like for me, you know, a shopping center. But yeah when you think about how many people have to commute in to Toronto, which is getting more difficult and how many of those people can really just kind of work closer to where they want you yeah. I think you're going to see, I mean, just generally you're going to see a proliferation of all of these different options. Like it's, it's all of, it's not, Oh, is it we work or bust? Right. It's, it's actually all of them. Right. Because you go down to the different formats, then you go down to the different communities. We're working with one co-working space that has a 3D cutter and a studio. Mm. I talked to another space that has a recording studio in it. 
And so there's so many different assets in the city that just are, are not seen by most people. Yeah. And so now with a little bit of you know, scale, we could start to bring some visibility to those spaces. And they're not only going to be viable and, and economical, but you're actually going to start to see some really beautiful, interesting spaces yeah. that you might not have even known exist in Toronto. I've been here 12 years. I had no idea right. that these spaces existed. Yeah. There was, um, I think, one of the locations that I was shocked by that you already have was on... It's on Logan, the, like gin distillery. Yeah, it reads. I still not even sure where that is. Yeah, but I, like I saw the pictures. I'm like, shit, I want to go work there for an afternoon. It's so I fully intend on it. Yeah, beautiful. And yeah. you're literally watching a family-owned distiller. Right, yeah. they're literally distilling gin across the glass. And the space is beautiful and airy. Yeah, um, furniture is beautiful. And and like it's funny actually if you're following us on Instagram, you'll see a lot of these stories that come up. Right, mm. these IG stories where people are like. <laughs> here's where I'm working, like kind of yeah. incredulous. Right. Um, and, and that's completely organic. That's like yep. people just going like, you, you, this is, this is crazy. It's crazy that no one actually knows this exists. And at yeah. this price point, like why are you suffering over there when you could be in here? Yeah. You know? Or, and I mean, if you think about it, like, you know, there's a couple of us that are the lucky ones, like this space, yeah. right? 900 square feet. Yep. We pay very little. <laughs> yeah. Like we pay like 900 under market value for a wow. one bedroom and it's this big. Right. And so like, this is a great spot for us to set up and work, but most right. people live in a fucking shoebox. Yeah, yeah. The average square foot per person now in in residential space in Toronto is under six hundred square feet. Yeah, right. Like yeah. that's not very much. I grew up in a suburban house, so like I was super spoiled. Right. But like, <laughs> when you think about six hundred square feet and the phrase like work from home, yeah, like what does that mean? Like yeah. here you're all set up. Like you've yeah. got space to work from home. Mm. But the average person is when you say work from home, like that does not compute. Yeah. There's no desk. There's no room for a desk. Yeah. There's no chair. Like, we're going to sit for eight hours. Yeah. So you see a lot of, actually, I played around with Instagram and just followed different hashtags, working from home, work from home. Mm. And it's funny because, like, they're cutesy, but it's like somebody sitting on, like, a lounge chair by the pool, which, like, sure, that yeah. could work that Sometimes. day. Right? Yeah. Or, like, okay, fine, you're sitting on the sofa, but if your entire job is working from home or if that's your primary space, that gets tired really quickly. Yeah, so does your right. back. <laughs> right. Right. And then, you know, I, I, I worry about it. I think about it because like I've worked from home for stretches and we have a completely remote team. So we work from home yeah. and there's a limit. Right. And I think that's like one of those things we're not talking about is actually the viability of work from home for the long term of your productivity and your mental health. Yeah, absolutely. So. And so so now the company's got some foothold here. Um, how many locations? Uh, Thirty seven as of today. Got it. And so what's what's the game plan? Is it like let's let's get from 37 to 100 in Toronto, are you mm. tapping in other marketplaces? What, what's the direction where you guys going? Yeah, so, you know, Toronto has 140 neighborhoods. I think we're in like 20, right? Right. So like one in seven neighborhoods. Mm. And Toronto's a beautiful case for us. Like Toronto's a knowledge economy, very well connected um, with our technology, Wi-Fi everywhere, everyone's got high speed everything, everyone's got a laptop and a smartphone. Like we're so digitally enabled, yeah. like we're ripe for this. Yeah. Um, further, real estate's super expensive. And so as you're trying to make a decision, you're kind of like, okay, what are my other options? Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, transportation kind of is tough, right? We're constantly under construction. Um, and so moving around isn't that great. And that, this is the summer. This is yeah. like supposedly a good season, but it's also construction <laughs> season. Uh, when, the, when the snow hits, it's going to suck. Yep. Um, and so as Torontonians, we see a very present problem in front of us and mm -hmm. we think we've got a relevant solution. Yep. And that's a relevant solution now, but it's also this trend, right? Something like 600, there's something like 600,000 freelancers in Toronto, right? Yeah. People that are doing all kinds of different contract work. And that's now, that's like the future is the acceleration of that trend. Yeah. And so where is everyone supposed to go, right? We agree that it's already expensive and the spaces at home are limited. Yeah. Moving around the city is getting better, but mm. not this week. Yep. Um, and so there's so much of a market here um, that um, we can really grow significantly. We have 6,000 members. So when I think 600,000 and 6,000, like we're 1%, of, we've met 1% of the people that we, yep. should, we should have met. Sure. Right. So it's super early for us. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Toronto kind of building that out as a yep. full model and then yeah. kind of see yeah. where else might make sense yeah, down the road. We're getting, you know, so like we're getting signal from a bunch of different cities. People are with, with hospitality spaces are reaching out from other countries, mm. uh, other big cities. Um, our members are 
opening up our app in other in other cities. Right. Because <laughs> you're kind of like, where is the flex day around here? And you're like, no, ah, it's a one. Toronto thing. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, we want we're in service of the market, right? The market tells us what what to do. Yeah. And so, in that case, we're like, okay, so there's something, there's some interest broadly, um, but for this thing to really work, it's about matchmaking, mm -hmm. right? And so. Um, here's where we're making the match and uh, there's tons of demand here but yes at some point we'll have to look at where that goes next sure um, and i think our members are going to tell us yeah absolutely what's the most interesting thing about flex day as a company as a product just the most interesting thing i mean i so i'm i'm like obsessed with lathes i don't know if you lathe the thing that spins it's like a spinning tool okay um so it turns out that the lathe is, this is like ESO technology, but it turns out the lathe is one of those rare tools that you can use before it's fully done to make itself you can l use a half made lathe okay. to make a lathe okay. and then in fact you can use a lathe to make another lathe right lathe. and so um i'm obsessed with it because i love working on problems that i face personally mm -hmm. and that i can feel intrinsically and so the most important thing i think about flex day from a team perspective is that we work in flex day yeah. right we're not like okay cool you guys use that we're going to use this right. special brew we're in the spaces we're talking to this to the staff we're among our members mm -hmm. um, and so we're very close to the problem every part of it right so like how how long do we want to sit here and yeah. like what next now I've, I've been here a few hours what's next or like i keep seeing this person like how do we create these interactions so that's that's the texture of our product that yeah. you know the, the, the headline stuff i think we've figured some stuff out there's mm -hmm. obviously refinement required but there's so much happening in these spaces, right? There's so much serendipity ripe yeah. for, for um, some sort of design. Um, and so uh, th that, I think we're getting to insight way faster than if we were separate from the product problem. So uh, I, I love that we are very much immersed in it. Very cool, very cool. And so to talk about kind of the, talk about the growth and kind of where, so you started two years ago yeah. And kind of like what's been the trajectory so far? Yeah, I mean, we're a Toronto startup story, right? So like <laughs> you ship and then it's like, okay, cool, like that works. And you're like, mm, that wasn't it. And then and, and, and. Um, and then in our case, uh, we're building a marketplace. So, you know, our story goes, um, so just under almost two years ago. So I think in September of 2017 was the first test. There was an announcement on Startup North, the Facebook group, um, Justin and that early team had put together three restaurants on the corner of Spadina and Richmond, which is like our, you know, like our tech corridor. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just put an announcement out and said like, hey, you know, we're going to try this thing. It's going to be this price. Uh, you can use an app and like see if someone shows up. Yeah. And something like 70 people paid right up front. Hmm. And, and, and like that's shocking because yeah. like we don't have anything. There's like nowhere to show up. It's like the brand is brand new. The website you use a Wayback Machine. Like right. that's that, you know, like in, in the context of uh, the Reed Hoffman's in the world, they say like ship when it's, well, it's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. And people were so ready to take whatever solution or to exactly. try something yeah. because, because like that's something that's unseen. Like all these 600,000 people are unseen. They're like whizzing by you on their bikes and their heads down in a coffee shop and stuff like that. But like, I think it spoke just like that LinkedIn post. It spoke to this underlying need for an in-between space, mm -hmm. a space that I didn't have to pay quite the same amount of money as like a formal co-working space yeah. or have any sort of ongoing commitment. So that's how it started. Um, and then we continued to refine from that, you, you know, sitting in the spaces, talking to members, looking at analytics, refined um, what we can charge and how people are expecting to pay for it, um, refined what that interaction in the app needs to be yep. so that you feel confident that you're going to get something at the end of it and then on the on the supply side it's figuring out with our partners how to make that i mean how to how to really truly design that social contract right yep. because that's something that you know is imperative for us they're the ones that actually are providing the hospitality at the end of it right and so we need to set them up for success and so um the iterations have been continual on each side of that right mm -hmm. the demand side our members the supply partner side and then our side to really be sort of market makers and understand behind the scenes what's actually happening here what do people right. want more of mm. and so we can you know we can invest in ourselves and the technology that enables that and allows us to be um, more active builders of yeah. this and not get caught so much in the operations or make it really clean experiences but then but then work on 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 um, 
moving our weight to each part of the market. So for example, now our members have said, we love, we love like the network, but we'd love more like formality, right? We want like a structured environment. You know, one of the other things they're saying to us is, I love to be able to sit open and, and hang out, but every once in a while, I want to get my team together in a, in a meeting room. Like, can you guys help me out with that? Right. I want to do an offsite, but like, you, you know, I'm here for my workspace and mm. the space mm, question, can I use it like that? Yeah. And so we're, we're now working with our partners to working with new partners to bring on the right type of supply as demanded by our members, um, testing out meeting rooms, right? So it's this curiosity where yeah. the, the, the trajectory is like, I mean, there's a thousand little stories, <laughs> but really it comes down to like, where's, where, where are we feeling like we need to focus our energy? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and right now it's about really making this thing click, right? Making it really obvious, taking advantage of some more automation to give people transparency and control um, because then we can really focus again on growth in this market. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a passionate Torontonian. There's <laughs> 120 neighborhoods that I think have our members in them right. that we don't provide a solution for. And, and, and really there should be one. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. Very well thought out. You guys seem to have like a, um, the cust the customer experience and that journey, like it feels mm. like you're, because you're living and breathing it, mm. it's very, I can hear the words and they're very insightful mm. and it's like an automatic insightfulness. So that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, and then how, so how are you getting your users now? Mm. How are you, how are you building your user base? You, you said you're at 6,000. 6,000 members now. Yep. This is 6,000 people have made accounts, downloaded the app, right? Um, and uh, it's crazy because we don't spend any money on that. Um, a lot of it's word of mouth. There's like an inherent virality to it. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. We, we did an offsite um, like a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Mm -hmm. And it was out in the Caledon area. And as part of the offsite, we're like, it's beautiful. Let's go take a hike, right? right. Team hike. And, and then it, it turned to an extreme hike. We're like going down ravines and at a rock bed barefoot. Um, but we literally like there's, so there's five of us on our core team. And we're going down river and coming up river is this family of four. Um, looks like mom and dad and two young boys. And we're like, you know, we're joking. We're like, who else is out here? On like, I think it was a Wednesday morning or something. Um, and we're like, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're this small company. We're, we're just doing an offsite and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's flat flex day. It's in Toronto. And like the mom's like, oh, flex day. Of course. I know exactly who you guys are. Like, <laughs> This is kind of insane because yeah. we're five people and we're not been around that long. We have yeah. no physical presence. We don't buy any advertising. Um, and so I think it's, it's just like the inherent virality. I think like it's one of those rare things I've worked on in my career that my mom just gets right out of the box. Hmm. Here's this is happening and this is happening and together something better happens. That's unique. My mom still says he does things on the internet. It's <laughs> yeah, basically right. the gist of what I get from her. <laughs> Thanks, right. mom. I appreciate that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, so it's it's like it's kind of like it's it's um, the the virality of it is like the pain is so broadly felt, yeah. right, and not necessarily um, talked about. Um, the the concept is kind of simple, and so I think there's a lot of curiosity and like that doesn't sound crazy, but I wonder how it works. Yeah. Right. And so. Um, what is special about our product is is maybe you see the messaging and it's it's for you, uh, but at the very least you know someone that's suffering. Yep. Right. And so you might let them know. And so a lot of that is uh, a lot of our growth has been. I think last time we checked something like thirty percent of our signups were referrals. Mm -hmm. Somebody had opened up the app and just gone like download Flex Day and we can see that. Right. But I think much more of that is word of mouth, right? People telling each other or messaging each other. We notice that people are tagging each other on like LinkedIn and Facebook and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's been like the beauty of our thing. We've got to do more with that. Mm -hmm. And it, reasonably, I mean, you're thinking about from an acquisition perspective, based on our price point, we're not, we're probably not going to fly blimp, blimp over the city. Yeah. Um, unless the ROI is really clear, um, <laughs> but it's, it's all about these little tweaks and like reinvesting in the product, making it so useful that yeah. somebody's, somebody's like, I don't know why you're trying that when you could be doing this right. for probably cheaper. Right. One thing that I've been toying with, I heard, uh, there's this guy, Mike Kim, who I've been talking to a little bit on Instagram. I've, I've mm. given him, actually I was giving him my YouTube strategy for the pod, his podcast. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was, he interviewed this Dr. Mark. I can't remember his last name, but he has a product called uh, Virtual Summit, okay. virtualsummit.com or something like that. And what it does is um, you can create 
like a conference on the internet, mm. this tool does the whole thing. Mm. And so everything from you put in all the people you want to have speak, mm. it automatically sends out to be like, hey, you forgot to add a profile picture. Hey, you mm. forgot to do that. Like it reminds them about stuff. Mm. Um, and they can pre-record their talk and then it gets uploaded and then you can set it up where um, people can come in. You can get like the first day is free, but you can mm. buy the premium to get access to all the lectures anytime you want. Right. But and it makes a conference online, but it's all in one. Right. So I started playing with it. I'm really excited about it because I think it's going to work really well for a couple of ideas I have. Mm. But one thing it just popped into my head for you guys. Mm. So I think there's a whole bunch of success stories mm. of mid to bigger companies mm. who have taken their stuff mm -hmm. from everyone has to be here mm -hmm. to like, hmm, maybe we need half the space and people can mm -hmm. be a little bit more free. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you made a one day summit yeah. about, that's cool, right? About yep. how, how have you had success letting your people work remote and right. You're going to have different people. One guy's going to say like, oh, well we added this project management thing and that system has worked. Yeah. Someone's going to say, oh, well, you know, I had to sit down and I found the people that made sense for it to go out. But I bet you there's amazing stories that are really relatable to the companies that you want their employees on. Yeah. Right. And I bet you if you could find some mid-sized guys that are now, oh, you know what? We're going to start letting people. Right. You might get 500 signups right. at a time instead of just that one freelancer. Right. So that might be an interesting place to play. That's cool. So yep. creating the summit. And then um, the nice thing is people are still really honored. Like, oh, I want to talk at this conference. Great. Like right. you can get most people to do it without paying them. Yep. But if, you, if they're big enough, maybe you do. But then they want to put it out on their social. Right. You put it on LinkedIn. You guys have a big enough network with Justin and that. Yep. Um, that might be a really interesting idea. That's to cool. Play with. Yeah. yeah, totally. And it's, it's, it's so funny because when we think about the applicability of our product, there's mm -hmm. so much. It's so obvious for the independents. Yeah. Um, we're starting to see a small teams come on. We had a team yeah. of 11 leave their office and come join us. Mm. Um, and it just made sense. They started saving thousands of dollars the next month, right? right? And now we're starting to see really big brands, like international brands, um, sign up, right? Individuals from those places. Yep. But what's curious is, is you know, even in that LinkedIn post that we talked about right off the top, there's 400,000 views, tons of engagement, none of it from senior folks. This is all the people that are forced to show up somewhere. Right. <laughs> that kind of like, yes, that, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so there's this weird like Stockholm syndrome maybe, but there, there's just weird like policy or, or something inertia. There's some sort of tie-in, right? Where if you bought the office, you want to justify it, right? You're like, well, we yeah. paid for it. We outfitted it. It's an address. And if we bring people through here and it's empty, what does that really look like? And yep. they're spending all this money. So it's, it's, a, it's a slow burn for some of these bigger companies, yeah. we find. Even though the ones that depend on millennial talent have had to be more progressive yep. and create more work, you know, remote work policies and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I think we need to start planting these seeds because like for some people, it's like, I'm there, I'm showing up later. Mm -hmm. And then for some people, they're kind of trapped in these other social contracts that don't free them up. Yeah to do something like this. So yeah, it's a great idea. Even the idea of uh, a pod, I'm just obsessed with podcasting right now. So, yeah. <laughs> but even the idea of a podcast where you could like yeah. gather the content from the, Hey, business owner, where your entire team's remote. You could even mm. find the guys that have coming on, come on board with you, mm. interview the founders of those. Hey, as a flex day user, what got you here? How have you structured whatever and make it educational and then put it out into the world of like, I'm looking for this, yep. how do I get it across? Yep. And I think the easiest way, especially if you make longer form and you, you know, maybe sit down with, even if you just sit down with a handful of people and record mm -hmm. an hour episode of five versions of it, right? Yep. Find people that have a bit of a different story in attaching to being more flexible with people's workspaces. Yeah. Um, and then what I'm doing, this is a technique I was, I was telling Mike about, it's advertising it on YouTube Mm. based on what people searched on Google. Mm. So cool. not buying a Google ad because right. they're expensive. Yeah. But people that are looking up ways to let my team work remote. Yeah. How do I da 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 da. Yeah. So it's not a Google ad going to the blog, right. but the next time they go on YouTube, the episode could be a pre-roll ad yeah. on YouTube. And you could pay yeah. very little for that. And then that's just like a your brand on it. Yeah. And then some real like real practical education right. on like how do I start moving my team? And if you're the one that gets the idea rolling and they said, "You know what? 
like financially, it's a bitch to have an office this big. I want to start moving away, yeah. but I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm an older guy. I don't know how this works. I right. feel like everyone's just going to be on the couch in their pajamas. Right. And if you can put them in touch with their peers of like, how have we done it? Right. It might be an interesting thing to, to tap into. Yeah. And then I, with the YouTube ads, so I Google search something, the, ep- the episode of whatever the show is goes up. The, the entire episode goes to the pre-roll ad. That's oh, wow. one thing that people are doing yeah. that I, I'm playing with the game and yeah. it's working really well. People are watching the whole episode as so the pre-roll to a video. my average... So all of my videos go up as an ad on YouTube pre-roll. Okay. Um, I spend 20 to 50 bucks advertising each episode. Okay. And so I get between 2,500 and 5,000 views okay. on average per episode. And it's almost all paid. So okay. it's like I've searched and that, that came up. My average watch time out of my last 40,000 views, my average watch time is 20 minutes and 19 seconds right now. So they got to this point in the episode. Yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing we're there. <laughs> no, we're past that. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, and so that's really interesting because it's like there's – I was already specifically looking. Mm. And then your video title is how the, how the CEO of a 200-person company got yeah. their team working remote. And you're like, right. oh, shit. Like I – I okay, and if I don't, then if I don't have to click to yes. go past the yes. trailer, it's just like one la- less piece. Totally, um, it's a little counterintuitive because it's a fucking long ad. Yeah, I didn't even know they allowed that. I thought it was all like these... it can be. It can be any YouTube video. Huh. They have recommendations, right. but I say screw the recommendations based on what we've been seeing. I mean, people are watching twenty minutes of it there. <laughs> yeah, and then we're getting people on the back end, you know hitting us up on Facebook saying, hey, I saw the episode with whatever. Right. This is a cool idea. Come do it for me. Cool. And so it's like a lead generation piece, which I think you could use the same thing. Yeah. So you don't do, you, can you put hooks into the video so that it comes back to We're you? We're not there yet. I don't understand how I don't any of it works. Yeah. Um, what I do is I have these two audio streams that yeah. get merged with the video. Yeah. Um, I, do, I use a iPhone because... DSLRs turn off after 20 minutes or yeah. 30. They time out. Okay. And then, so I've tried it where we had like three cameras, but you have to keep like turning stuff on. Okay. So it's like iPhone and basically the video and the audio get mashed together. Yeah. It gets attached and then cut the beginning, cut the end when we're like in what it, where we're walking sure, around. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then it takes us less than an hour to, ep- to edit an episode. Oh, wow. It's like 35 minutes. Do you do it here? Uh, one of my employees yeah, does it on their computer. Okay. But we don't cut anything out. We just right. mash it all together. Right. And then it's good. It's ready for yeah, the internet. Yeah. So for me, the speed, because yeah. I want to be able to put out, we only do one episode a week. Okay. I'd love to be able to do more. Right. Right? Because it's just like, it's had such a positive impact. This is Joe us. Rogan. <laughs> right? He's had like a thousand episodes or something. Like, it's crazy. Dude is like, he's at it. Yeah. yeah. But I'm a little bit more limited because it's such it's like it's a marketing talk show. <laughs> It could so be whatever I, you want. It could, be, it could, it could evolve. <laughs> yeah, I, I do listen to Joe Rogan, actually. He's yeah. a very interesting dude. Yeah, he's nuts, right. but because like, yeah. somebody claimed that he's going to make like $100 million this year. Yeah. Just a podcast. You look at his little garage. He's got a sound engineer. Yep. He's got some trinkets. He's upgraded his mics. Mm-hmm. But like, it's not crazy, right? Yeah. It's not like 10% yeah. of his money is going to like run Production. this thing. No, it's pretty crazy. And he has the machine where... All the all the video cameras and all the mics mm. hook up, so it's mm. automatically syncing it. Oh, so it's like it's producing the episode right yeah. there. Yeah. Um, I looked at the video camera. I funny while I was investing, I was like, maybe I'm gonna get one of the video cameras that he. And it was two. It was like two thousand bucks. I'm like, fuck it, my iPhone. When you get to hundred million dollars, that's 2, right. Bucks will disappear. <laughs> that's right. I have no YouTube revenue <laughs> coming in right now, but it's fun. It's a good experiment, and I yeah. think it gives us. Like one episode will give mm. us between 15 and 30 pieces of content. Mm. And to me, that's the best way. What do you mean? How do you, like how are you cutting other? Yeah. So what I, it? so what I do and whether I'm doing it, I've, I'm going to start doing it remotely because mm. I can get guests around the world so mm. using zoom. So it'll record and record and then it has the mics. So I'm going to take that. And right now I take this. Right. So I have an hour long episode. Um, what I do is I have somebody that edits the whole thing together. Mm. So that's one episode. Mm. Then they go through and find s- clips of it that are under a minute yeah. that are like decent clips. So those are Instagram posts okay. and Instagram stories. Okay. Then I find stuff that's under 10 minute for Facebook TV and in- Instagram TV. Okay. Um, and then I repurpose graphically. Like we'll take some pictures of us kind of staged and like talking. Um, so I'll take that for, um, for posts, for Instagram, Facebook posts. Sometimes I'll like fade it out with a quote 
Like we write down some of the best quotes from the episodes. Mm. So we make some graphics to do with that. So cool. two or three of those. And then we use these wave files. Uh, it's wave.wavve.co. Okay. So you put a picture and then okay. you can edit the picture however you want. But then you put the audio clip into wave. Okay. And it has it has like like a circle one where it's pulsating or like the wave like that, but it's oh, actually matched to the audio. Yeah, okay. So they're it. they're like video. So right. with the one minute clips, we'll make yeah. those into wave audio yeah. as well as the physical video. Yeah. And then by the time we use it over two weeks, it's like twenty to thirty that's pieces. That's amazing. Yeah. So we get and that's one person post production doing all that whole yeah that whole spectrum of things. That's an intern. Wow. Yeah. So we use uh, Gen M. Okay. Which is like a company out of Ottawa. I met with the founder a while ago. He's people that are looking for real hands-on practical experience while yeah. they're a student because right. in school they're not getting that right. around video editing or marketing or whatever. Right. So you pay Gen M, it's like 47 bucks a month. Okay. And then you interview a student. You say like, I want someone that can, that has these skills that knows yeah. these programs and it gives you a database. You interview them, yeah. you meet them. And then part of the, ex so the, the exchange is that you get 10 hours a week out of the intern. And then you give them some kind of like feedback, but you give them real life stuff to work yeah. on. So they get that. And then we, we always say, so we're on our second round of this. Okay. We'll say like, hey, give us the list of things you want to know about. Because I either have a course or I've experienced it and I'll sit down with you for an hour on the yeah. phone or whatever. And I'll give you some real life experience out of it. Right. Um, and so what we do is we have um, a pages doc okay. that has a map of like, here's the video and then here's all the pieces and then right. the examples. Family and we're tree. like, yeah, family tree of every piece of content that's, that's made from cool. every episode. So they just get that yeah. and a Google Drive of all the assets. And then they're yeah. like, oh, okay, make this, make this, make this, make this. That's so cool. Yeah. So I'd love your help to boot that up. Mm -hmm. Because we have so many of these members, like so many of our members are like individual superheroes, right? You've yeah. heard of the work they've done. Yeah. You might know the companies they did it with, mm -hmm. but you don't know them. Yeah. And so when they come out and they're kind of sitting and, you know, they're just, just hanging out with regular people. Mm -hmm. Um, it, you, you kind of you, you kind of glaze over them, and um, when you start to talk to them and you talk about the, you know, their vision for life, you, you're starting to talk to some some real visionaries, right? Yeah. I often have this visual that the machines are coming, right? <laughs> and the ones that are aware that the machines are coming are checking how far behind them they they are, right. how, about, how far yeah, um, behind. Are. Yeah. And so. Um, the visual I have in my head is I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm constantly racing to higher ground. Right. Because I work a lot with technologists, I, I know what's next. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like, yeah, that part is, I'm, I'm never going to do that again. Right. right? That, that's not a job anymore. Right. right. Like those early entry level jobs, you're like, that used to be outsourced. Now they're not an outsourced, just OCR'd into a database. <laughs> it just, it happened in a few seconds. You, yeah. for, you forgot that somebody used to do that. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious about, um, these people that also have that inkling in their brain that says, you know, if I really take ownership over this, if I can really build my capacity and my brand around this, then I can escape the machines. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be a mulch fest when they, when they, they get, and they've got entire like lawyers and accountants, like people that with professional degrees are getting chewed up. And so yeah. the people we're meeting are, are real renegades in that sense. They're super inspirational because of what they're capable of, but also yeah. the degree of risk they've taken because they want to have ownership. So I would love to tell their stories. Yeah. Because like, as you talk to them, you're like, okay, I, we both have work to do today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's super interesting and relevant, but right. also like both of us came here to do work today. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd love your help to boot that up. Cool. Yeah. That'd be fun. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, anything else? Any other thoughts? Thoughts and prayers? Um, no, man. I'd love for you to come check out our spaces. Um, if folks are watching and, and uh, you know, interested in what we're doing, uh, we offer a free trial to download the app at flexday.com. Go to the app stores. Um, it takes a couple minutes to do all of that. Um, and then we've got availability every day of the week, including weekends. Um, and we've got 37 spaces, and they go from $3 to $25 per day. And so um, use your first $5 to however you see fit, wherever that, whatever that makes sense for you, um, and, and give us feedback. You know, we're Toronto, we're local. I'd love to meet people individually if that's available or get on the phone. Uh, because really, we want to make this thing work. You yeah. know, each of us on our core team has struggled with the existing options, and I think we're the best position to really offer viable options. Yeah. You know, um, somebody recently was telling me that you know, I was telling you off the top that there are 160 co-working offices in Toronto. Yeah. That amounts to about 25,000 co-working seats. 
I also told you there's 600,000 freelancers, yeah. right? Like we literally cannot build enough capacity to store, to house, to service all of the people who are doing their work in the, in the dark creatures of the city, yeah. right? poorly equipped. Yeah. And, uh, and so we have a lot of compassion. I think we're actually equipped for a solution. I want to be part of that solution. I want our, our citizens to help us get there. Um, and so um, I, I guess let, that's an open invite. Um, let me know. I'd love to buy lunch. Um, you as well. There you go. Um, so try Flex Day. Flexday.com. Flexday.com. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Cheers.